Hey, check out this card though. There's a male card though. There's the red crest. The crest is elevated right now. He is agitated. Do you see this? Ah! Biting me! Biting me! Okay, I'm gonna let him go. I hate when they bite me. This guy... Hurts. Man, alright. Anyway, I'll tell you more about card. <laughs> Not right now! Okay. Uh... Did I check the... Yeah, I already got the band number. Okay. Ow! God! These things hurt. Well, I am glad to be here at the Wildlife Society annual meeting. It's been a couple years since I've attended a Wildlife Society meeting, but when I saw the call for abstracts and it featured a Northern Cardinal, I knew I had to be part of this conference. I just didn't know that I would be sitting in a closet recording my talk when I submitted the abstract. But here we go. Let's have some fun. I'm sharing today some research that I've been doing in regards to supporting the revision of the Northern Cardinal Species Account for the Birds of the World series. Uh, so I've been working with some collaborators on this, and one of the sections that I was charged with reviewing was the and updating was the dispersal section. Cardinals are generally considered to be a rather sedentary species. They're non-migratory. They have very limited dispersal. That's kind of the, the baseline knowledge for this species. As we're thinking about dispersal, Let's think about also how we study dispersal. These are probably methods that are familiar to many of us. And there's actually a variety of both direct and indirect approaches. Probably the most familiar, most common direct approach is what's called a plot-based approach, where we define a plot, like the one on the right here, that's outlined in white. And then within that plot, we mark some animals. We catch them, we mark them, we release them, and then at some later time, presumably after they've dispersed, after they've moved, we recatch them, and then we can estimate and measure the distance that those animals have dispersed. And we can look for some relationships between age and sex, time of year, things like that for dispersal in those animals. But one of the problems that comes up here is we're limited to our detection of those animals to the areas that we search. If an animal moves outside of our study plot, we're just not going to be able to detect it. So this approach will bias our estimate estimate of dispersal distances to the distances that we can even potentially detect within our study plot. One way around this or one way to overcome this limitation is to define a buffer area where we search that buffer area for potential for animals that might have moved into that buffer area. But even then, we still have this situation where we might have animals that have moved farther than our buffer search area as well. Well, fortunately, the bird banding records from the bird banding lab actually span the continent. So we overcome that limitation of the plot-based approach when we have detection that's actually continent-wide. So the objective of this, this project is I wanted to describe cardinal movements using these records from the bird banding lab. And specifically, I wanted to update this analysis with the most recent 50 years of data because the, the most recent analysis prior to this has been through 1961. The Bird Banding Lab is responsible for banding across the United States, putting on federal ba bird bands that have a unique identifier. And in the last hundred years, there have been over 77 million birds that have been banded and archived in the Bird Banding Lab database. There are about 5 million encounters, and each year there's about another million birds banded, with about another 100,000 encounters reported each year. I've used this term encounter a couple of times, and that's really critical to the, the analysis that I'm going to present here. So what is an encounter? To describe that, let me use an example with this cardinal right here. So where I'm showing you on this study site is where this cardinal was banded, initially caught and banded on May 20th, 2018. That was the, the starting point from a data perspective for this bird. That was reported to the bird banding lab, so it, that capture location and time and, da and date enter the bird banding lab database. Most banded birds never are reported again. Birds that the most the, the situation where birds are most commonly seen again is by the same research team that banded that bird. So typically that same research team, that's the, the team or the individual or the group that's most likely to observe that bird again because they're often continuing to work in that same study area. In that case, that time when the bird is seen or recaptured again might be reported to the bird banding lab. If it is, that generates an encounter record in the bird banding lab database. I say it might be reported because if it's a local recapture, if the bird hasn't changed status with some new marking being put on it, like a, a data logger or a transmitter or something like that, it doesn't 
have to be reported to the banding lab. Only if it's moved 10-minute ban banding blocks or if it's changed status does it have to be reported. So there's also a lot of encounters that take place within the same study system by the same researchers that don't, don't generate encounter records in the bird banding lab database. The general public can also generate encounters, and this often happens when they find a dead bird. There's a variety of reasons that birds might die, and then if someone finds the bird, picks it up, finds a band, they can go online, type in the band number, and report that to the bird banding lab. Or in the past, they could call the bird banding lab or send in a letter. Just because the bird dies and just because someone from the public finds it doesn't mean they're going to actually report it to the bird banding lab. So all birds that... that are found aren't necessarily returned or the band number returned to the bird banding lab to generate an encounter record in the database. So there's a lot of things that have to happen to generate an encounter record. And then less commonly, the public can also generate encounters from finding a living bird. So you have to be able to see the unique band number in order for it to generate an encounter record. But sometimes there are unique marks on the bird that allow one to identify it as an individual that would generate an encounter record in the bird banding lab. So here's one example. With this particular cardinal here, um, after about 18 months, it was detected across the road from this study site. And someone who has a bird feeder and specifically has a camera set up on their bird feeder to take pictures of the birds as they come, got a picture of this cardinal. And on some of the subsequent pictures, they noticed that it had bands on its legs. And so this person, uh, this homeowner, reported this these photos to the bird banding lab, which then the bird banding lab put me in contact with the homeowner to try to figure out who this individual bird was. And in this case, this bird had just moved across the street to visit the bird feeder. Even with using the bird banding records, there's still some biases in encounters. Specifically, because the detection probability by researchers on the study plot is highest, that can still generate a bias towards overestimating the probability of birds staying close. In other words, uh, if we use the, the encounters generated by researchers, it will bias our estimates of movements to those that are non-movements or very short distance movements, because that's just where the researchers are most likely to encounter their, the, the birds. They're, they're going to miss the ones that have moved farther away. Another issue that we have with using the bird banding lab data is the resolution, the spatial resolution of the data. Bird banding records might be reported as exact coordinates. Encounters might be reported as exact coordinates, but not necessarily. Specifically, over time, the location resolution has actually changed. The bird banding lab requires at least a resolution to the 10 minute banding block, but sometimes the records are more precise and different banding operations, different bird banders will report their data at different levels of resolution. So that creates some issues because a bird could move 10 minute blocks and just move a short distance to get into a new, a different block. However, when that's recorded by the 10 minute block data resolution, spatial resolution in the bird banding lab database, it would look as though the bird had moved from the center of one 10 minute block to the center of another 10 minute block. So that would overestimate the distance movement, distance that bird moved. So in order to overcome this or this limitation for and for consistency in this analysis, I only used the 10 minute block locations for birds and I used a 25 kilometer cutoff. So anything below 25 kilometers, I didn't suggest that we had consistent resolution in the data to be able to really say anything below 25 kilometers, which is about 16 miles. And also that corresponds to the movement where a bird would have moved the essentially the length of at least a whole block to, if they're moving 25 kilometers. So that um, gets us away from the instances where birds only made a short movement, but they uh, were tr registered as shifting blocks, changing blocks, or also any instances where bird might have moved, for instance, from a corner of one block to the corner of the same block, which was actually be a larger distance. Uh, but still, if they had moved 25 kilometers, they would cap be captured by moving to a different block. So that's why I used the 25 kilometer cutoff. Let's look at the number of encounters. In the bird banding lab database, there's over a million northern cardinals banded, but there's very few encounters. Remember, most banded birds are not seen again. There's over 11,000 encounters over this approximately 100-year period. But from those encounters, we needed to 
to deal with the, the, those biases in probability of detection that I mentioned earlier with scientists versus the public. So I, I removed some encounters from the database, specifically those that were less than three months apart, because I wanted to make sure the birds had the time to actually engage in a, in a movement. So three months is spanning it crossing into another season so they would have at least had the opportunity to move for instance birds of the young of the year had a chance to move at some um within that time period or after that time period um i also removed birds that are on periphery peripheral parts of their range uh repeats of the same bird so if a bird moved to a new location then it was repeatedly observed in that location i only used one of those and then observations by scientists so after removing all those that left fewer than three thousand encounters when we look at where those encounters take place there seems to be some association with where people are which makes sense because the gen these are reports by the general public and there needs to be people around to have some probability of people actually finding those encount uh, encountering those those dead birds so there's probably some bias here towards where those birds are found specifically around urbanized suburbanized area where there's larger numbers of people if we look at the encounters over time what i'm showing you on the x-axis here is years bundled into five years um, increments and then the number of encounters so su not surprisingly early on uh, there's not as many encounters. There's fewer birds banded total in the population. But then notice how that peaks. The number of encounters peaks in the 60s and 70s and then declines rather precipitously in the more recent decades. So we're, we're getting fewer encounters in recent years of cardinals. And it's important to note here, this is the, the random encounters from the public, not the encounters from scientific research. If we include those, actually our encounters, and part of the reason here that... Um, encounters are are going up in some in because of, from scientists is because of the reporting methods uh, have become easier with the bird banding lab to report those encounters for researchers so this is looking just at general random encounters from the general public those have gone down let's look at the dispersal distances the the pattern of dispersal so the first thing i want to point out here is that most cardinals are staying very close they're staying within 25 kilometers of their initial breeding location so where this red arrow here is i'm not even going to show this bar because it would be way off the chart 95 plus percent are staying within 25 kilometers and then there's a couple individuals that are way at the tail of this distribution past 500 kilometers more on those in a moment so let's just look at the individuals that are moving between 25 kilometers and fewer than 500. This is a pretty typical distribution for dispersal distances where most individuals are staying close. In this case with the cardinals, very close and very drop, this distribution drops off very quickly. If we look at the direction, the movement direction, there's not a clear pattern in where these cardinals are going. There is a slight trend for younger birds to be more likely to move greater than 25 kilometers, but that's not a very strong trend. I want to highlight these longest arrows here, which correspond to those five longest movements, those that are greater than 500 kilometers. It's hard to really say anything about these kind of strange anecdotes, but maybe we could point out that those movement distances have occurred, occurred over a range of years. They're not concentrated in the distant or recent past, and it includes both males and females making these movements. Let me just summarize a couple things here. From these results, we do see that, that we confirm that cardinals are really quite sedentary birds. Most are staying less than 25 kilometers from their initial banding location. Those ones that are moving really far, why are they doing that? Like, who, who knows why we could we could speculate but it's not really we don't really have any idea why they're going that far about five percent of those cardinals that are moving greater than 25 kilometers or 16 miles that's a small percentage but actually it corresponds to a large number of birds there are about 110 million northern cardinals in north america that means there's over 5 million cardinals moving about 25 kilometers or more each year that has some implications for range expansion, genetic mixing, song learning, and sharing. I want to focus finally on the change in encounters over time. Remember this pattern here? Why is that? Could this be a reflection of declining connections between people and the natural world as evidenced by declining rates in Boy Scouts and Girl Scout participation, for instance? Let's overlay those there. Could there be something to that pattern, perhaps?
And finally, let me just say thank you for your attention. And I'd like to thank all the people who have participated in bird banding and in the bird banding lab database over the years. Thank you.